Welcome to the Ignorance of Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Motherfucking Ojeda, and I don't know shit, but that's okay. All right, all right, let's get this shit started. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ignorance of Strength Podcast. Hope you all enjoyed episode number 60, the return of the ever popular shit show. Definitely uh, <laughs> have uh, had a lot of fun with the guys. I uh, was able to sync all our times up for once, uh, but they'll be back for episode 70. And if not episode 70, they'll be back uh, a little later than that. Uh, but we're back today with a brand new guest. Excited to have him on. Uh, pretty much, you know, uh, uh, I would say a uh, legendary career. Uh, Mr. Bruce Valanche. How are you doing, Bruce? All right. Legendarily. Carrying on. I'm delighted to be on this shit show. Of course, I've been on, <laughs> I've been on so many. I've been responsible for so many shit shows. I've written uh-huh. so many shit shows. Uh-huh. I, should be, I should be used to it by now, but this really isn't a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, no, I have uh, just a little a little background on that. Uh, on the on the podcast, uh, you know, my, my high school friends and I, every 10 episodes, we do what's called the shit show. So I guess this is the, uh, you know, um, this is just coming off the heels of the shit show. Oh, well, who who doesn't want to have shit on their heels? (laughs) There you go. Um, I actually, you know, I I, I really I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. I know you've been doing a lot of podcasts lately, right? Yeah. uh, You know, there's no live performance. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. just beginning to come back. And I do a lot of that. I do a lot of colleges and and a lot of uh, uh, cabarets and stuff around the theaters around the country, telling my stories and stuff. So, uh, this replaces that. I get to come on here and tell stories. And even though there's not, you know, an audience, a live audience, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, you, you kind of exercise that muscle. Plus, I'm writing a book, and every time I do one of these things, something comes up that I've forgotten about that I, I say, oh, I can put that in the book. So, right. uh, so it's therapeutic. <laughs> For sure. I think, you know, and usually what if it's a Zoom, you know, I'm just sitting here commando, and if I don't stand up and do a Jeffrey Tube, and I'm okay. <laughs> definitely um you know i think uh it, you see that a lot too a lot of people have have started podcasts um in this last year with the pandemic and everything like that i mean i started just simply because i was bored of shit you know same thing yeah. you know i i like talking to people and when you're kind of isolated and you have nothing to do you know um i know something like this is perfect therapy like you mentioned i know it's unfortunate that i have nothing to plug because you could probably, you know, make a few dollars, but <laughs> I overlooked that. It's the therapy. It's, it's just worth it. So, um, you know, right off the bat, I, I want to throw out there because a lot of my my uh, my listeners are people in, you know, my community. Uh, I grew up in Almonte, California, not too far from L.A. Um, and 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 I'm a, you know, I was born in 1986. I'm a 90s kid. You uh-huh. know? And so when 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 I heard your name, you know, and I'm sure you won't take offense to this. I didn't know exactly like. I haven't heard that name before, but when I saw you, I'm like, oh, I know exactly who he is. You know, I, I, I yeah. first and foremost, obviously, uh, Hollywood Squares. I had a beard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. And you were always the, uh, what was a middle uh, left square? I was, I was to the left of Whoopi, if that's possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, the other thing, too, is uh, I know you were in, uh, you, you, you were drawn as a Simpson. That's got to be something different. I was. Yeah, that was during that period. Uh, it was, it's one of the greatest thrills of my life because it keeps reverberating because people like you who weren't born when I started out know, know me from that. And people who wouldn't sleep with me in high school, you know, wrote me and said, dude, I had no idea you were so famous. My kids saw you on The Simpsons. Uh-huh. So, I mean, it's you know, it was it was like season eleven, and they're now like in what season thirty five. Yeah, it's so never it, ending. Yeah, it's just never it's never ending. It's called Pokemon, and uh-huh. it's a one line thing. And uh, uh, I'm sitting in a uh, the mayor of Springfield is making a speech, and I'm sitting in the audience, and he mm. say, he does a joke and it bombs, and he says, "Well, thanks, Bruce Valanche." Throws a card over his shoulder, and they cut to me in the audience in my uh, Fred Flintstone t shirt. Saying, well, Whoopi would have gotten a laugh, and and as a result, I got to go in and record it, and then I got they sent me a trunk of Simpson swag. Wow! Which is they said this is the same trunk we sent Elizabeth Taylor, so there may be some duplications if you ever meet her. And I I knew her; we did a lot of AIDS benefits together, and so uh-huh. I called her up and I said, "What's in your Simpsons trunk?" Uh-huh. And we and uh, it's fabulous because there's stuff I never put on the market. I mean, I've got Homer Simpson's bowling bag and a ball, which looks like an egg yolk. 
and it has no holes on it, but it has red dots and says drill holes here. <laughs> it's very Simpsons. That's that's really Prize cool. I mean, possession. Yeah, to, to be immortalized in the Simpsons. Um, but, you know, it's also, I think, uh, that speaks to your place in pop culture. You yeah, know? Exactly. I know. I have one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even just uh, based off of your, you know, your unique look, because um, a lot of people, you know, uh, actors and whatnot, you can, you, you know, you can kind of just like it, it blink and you'll miss it kind of thing. You're like, was it that person? Was it not that person? But I don't I think know. there's any there's any missing like you. You, no, you know, I get the stick and, you know, for Amy Schumer now and again. And uh, <laughs> she put yeah. me in her book and Michael Moore. Uh, and that's fun because I get people coming up, you know, right wingers come up and say, how can you say those things about our government? You know, oh. so, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, 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 I say that, that it's not me. I said <laughs> he doesn't he, he doesn't he, he's he, I don't wear a hat. He always uh, wears a hat. Yeah. He's always got, I think he, he was wearing them and then MAGA hats came in and he had to get rid of the baseball cap. So I, I think he may be capless these days, but, uh, but I, I get why they, you know, I was doing, a, I was uh, working in New York on a show and he was, doing, he did a one man show at a mm -hmm. theater on Broadway and I was staying at a hotel next door and I would get followed into the hotel by people, by fans mm -hmm. wanting to talk to Michael Moore and, you know, they would say, "Oh, he's staying next door," and I'd come out of the hotel to be a crowd. I said, "Why? They think you're Michael Moore." And it, it went on <laughs> like that. The other side, there was a show with Jake Gyllenhaal. Nobody mistook me for him. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I didn't get the uh, the Michael Moore uh, comparison, and now that you mentioned, I, I, I guess I could kind of see it if he threw on a wig and well, you know, we're, we're both blonde and and uh, big hair, and we're heavy and. Uh, uh, I think he may wear red glasses. I'm not sure. I know he wears glasses, but uh, uh, I, I, I think, you know, we both have amazing uh, chins. We have like, you know, we have several chins. We have waffles. And, so there's a, there's a certain similarity. D does he wear the yeah. ironic T-shirts as well? No, no. He, oh. uh, no, nah, he's, he's like a, a soccer dad. You know, he, he wears uh, just basic uh, uniform of the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, do you have an ironic T-shirt on today? I, I, that's what I do, I was actually. Really I have. Excited it's, uh, about. it's the Dodo. And I think you said, we will rise again. <laughs> you know, the Dodo, which is extinct. And, uh -huh. uh, and who knows? It may very, it, it, I don't, it never existed. It's from Alice in Wonderland. But uh, it was, it, I think in Alice in Wonderland, it was going extinct. I forget. Uh -huh. I, haven't, I haven't read it since I was a long time. I haven't read it since I had the correct drugs to read it under. <laughs> now you know if uh, I in, and, and I don't want to ask the same questions the podcast has been asking. So I like to ask people that have been on a, a podcast kick, right? What are some questions that you just get all the time where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to answer that. That's annoying. Or if you even have any of those. Oh, you know, they, they, I used to be a journalist, so I understand uh, uh, the need to kind of uh, uh, categorize things. So they say, what was the worst thing that ever happened on Hollywood Squares? Or who was the, who was the most impossible person? This is like, like people think that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know I, I don't have, I'd have to sit there and waste valuable time thinking about all the bad things that happened. I mean, and, but they always ask that because they think that'll get them, uh, you know, some, uh, a good bite. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, or, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, those, those kinds of, I mean, the other kind of questions, I don't care if, they, if they're specific about it. And generally that, that's kind of because they're, they, they haven't done enough homework to be specific. They don't know enough about you actually to ask you any real questions. So they right. just go for that general shit. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll but, keep, you I'll, know, I'll, no offense, whatever you want to ask is fine by me. Perfect. Yeah, I was, I was like, man, they must have asked me the same questions over and over again. But, you know, I, I'll just I'll go on with, with uh, what I've got. But I really, you know, uh, want to know just a little a little background on my, on my podcast, uh, Ignorance of Strength, right? Um, there's a lot of things <laughs> that people don't know about. You know, like, um, again, I mentioned, you know, I, I have a, a pretty uh, small community that, that's, that's, that listens. They're, they listen to every episode. Um, there are some people like in other countries that listen and other states that listen, but the people that I know personally that listen, you know, we grew up sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, lo lower, uh, lower economic status. And, and, you know, uh, we don't, 
wouldn't really know how to get into the entertainment world, right? And so that's something that I was really curious about because, you know, the, the closest I ever got to that was when I used to be a uh, security and I would be like a bouncer, a bodyguard for stuff. Right. Ah, and I yeah. always got like a, like a peek into your guys' world. Um, I did a lot of award shows. I know you, you wrote for a lot of award shows, yeah. um, but how did you get into, you know, the entertainment world? What was your first foot in? Well, I was a child actor. So it was, it was, uh, I got in early and, and that was because my parents were very smart and they realized I was happy when I was making faces in front of the mirror and when I was performing at, uh, at dinner parties and things like that, uh, or just around the house, you know. So uh, they encouraged it because they saw that I was happy. They were not, they weren't like, uh, like, they, it wasn't like, you know, Gypsy, like Mama Rose or like, or like uh, Britney Spears, or they weren't the kind of parents who were looking to make money off of the kid. And I mean, I because I I met a lot of other child actors who were supporting their families, and well, any money I made went into you know Bruce's college fund. Mm. But so it was all about me having a good time, and they, their fear was that I would not be able to make a living at it, that I would uh, have some something to fall back on. So they said, "Oh, be a write for newspapers; they'll never go away." <laughs> who knew? Mm-hmm. But, so I got in very early. I was a child model and then I was a child actor, but I was never a child star or you know, we'd be having this conversation in rehab. But they don't they don't really age well. Most uh-huh. of them. So uh, I, so that was how I got. I mean, I got into it that way. And then I, I was so smitten with it, I never I got out. And my mother was stage struck, too. I mean, she I think had she not married my my father, she would have had a career. As a, as a showgirl, you know, because uh, she's very pretty and uh, mm. as a dancer and all that. And she like and when she was a doctor's wife. So she organized a lot of benefits and charity things in which she would perform. Mm. Uh, so I could see that she was good, but uh, she never, you know, went after it. Um, but so I, I kind of grew up in it. And that's that's how I got into it. OK. Uh, those, um, it, it ain't Judy Garland, but it's, you know, kind of like <laughs> You know, uh, like 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 I mentioned, um, you know, anybody who does the, just a simple Google search, you know, will know that you've written on like every single award show. I've out done there. them all. I'm the egot of award show writers. I've written them all. I've um, been asked like twenty three times, and uh, all the Grammys, Emmys. I mean, I've, I have done them all. I'm mm-hmm. down to the American Bulimia Awards. We're looking <laughs> we're looking for a thin woman to honor this year. If you know anybody, <laughs> please submit their name. Um, so what, what would you consider yourself more uh, when it comes to entertainment? Would you say you're, you're more so a writer than anything? Uh, well, I'm a writer. I'm an actor. Uh, uh, I'm a comedian. I, you know, stripper. I mean, I, I do it. You name it, you book it, you got it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like performing is like if you like performing, performing is, is alpha. That's a, that's because you get that that rush of creating something and, and having a response when you're a writer. You know, you sit like Stephen King. You go to a, la- a cabin in 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 the woods until until your nurse cobbles you. You, know, you it's about isolation and and even the kind of writing I do, which is collaborative. At a certain point, you wind up sitting and facing the blank screen yourself. It used to be the blank page. I'm that old. Now it's the blank screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but you know you you get you have to get into what I call the alpha state, which is where uh, everybody you you freeze everything else in the world out and you're just focusing on what you're doing, and that's very gratifying. But you know it doesn't give you the rush that performance gives you. Mm-hmm. When uh, when when speaking about something like writing, you know, um, there's a lot of people that that are that are writers out there. I've interviewed a lot of potential writers on the podcast. You know, people that that are just starting out, uh-huh. um, and, and you know they're 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 dying to break in. Right. So yeah. would you say that's a difficult process these days to, to break in? Yeah, I, I would, except it occurs to me that it's now become easier thanks to the Internet, mm. because, you know, you have a podcast. Where would you do this if there were no Internet? Where would you have right. done this before? Right, How try would you to get on that? radio somehow? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's some some ham radio, amateur radio. I mean, uh-huh. student radio. Where would you have done it? And now, I mean. Anybody, I mean, influencers, TikTok, I mean, there, there are all these avenues open for people to make themselves famous mm-hmm. and to get their work seen. So I think it, it, 
is probably easier. I mean, the conventional routes are as difficult as always. If you're a writer, unfortunately, you have to write. And then you have to get it to somebody who will read it. And that is how you get established. But that could be done easier on uh, with, with the internet. I mean, you can create a blog and people, and, and it will become a best-selling book. Mm-hmm. And, and guess what? You're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that's exactly where, you know, I wanted to, to get to is that um, everybody now has a platform, you know, yeah. and and, and uh, I think even something like, uh, you know, like YouTube is 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 probably a super powerful tool for getting performers, you know, um, a spotlight, you know. Uh, there, well, look, uh, yeah, I mean, Randy Rainbow, who's a, a friend of mine, is, is like made a, made a fortune and done very well, but just off of doing song parodies on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he's, I mean, there are, there are many bigger uh, names I can't think of. I mean, people who have, who have burst out of YouTube and, and, and become, uh, become somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, entertainment's all relative, you know, but I, I mean, I find a lot of stuff too on, on YouTube or on Instagram that, you know, it's supposed to be comedy, but it's not funny, you know, and, and I feel like a lot of people maybe have, have kind of just lost their touch. And I don't know how there's like millions of views on, on certain videos. I'm like, it, this is kind of boring, you know, but people love it. Um, I don't know if I'm just kind of getting, getting to the point where I'm like uh, becoming a, you know, I, I'm in my mid thirties, but I'm becoming the old guy who just doesn't get it anymore. Um, but it depends. I mean, that, it depends on what there is to get. I mean, some people uh, aren't that talented, but they get exposure. That's the difference now. Is that that before the internet, if you if you weren't very good, you had to be really, really, really ambitious to get to get noticed. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but now, any, anybody gets noticed, whether they're good, bad, ugly, uh, indifferent, uh, they get noticed. So it's. Uh, and of course, that it, that's a kind of encouragement that uh, that brings out more people who don't have it. To mm-hmm. just and the, the market gets <laughs> gets flooded with that. Mm-hmm. And it used it used to be that you know enough people said no and and you got the message. Mm-hmm. But now you know I mean you know there's GoFundMe and go kickstart me and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it's like nobody ever can give up. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Sooner or later, sooner or later, you turn to somebody and you say. You're 50. It's not happening. <laughs> but, you know, the strange thing is sometimes it does happen at 50, 60 well, years old now. Unless some, and then it does happen. Exactly. Okay. The moral of that story is then suddenly you're Rodney Dangerfield and you're 50 and suddenly you explode and become a big, a, the biggest star in the world for a, a minute. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's rare. But mm-hmm. everybody thinks it will happen to them. Everybody thinks, well, you know, they didn't believe that Sylvester Stallone, they, he forced them to do Rocky with, I, with him. And I said, Sylvester Stallone was a well-known actor. Mm-hmm. And, and this was a low-ball project. Mm-hmm. And he got it made. It became a gigantic thing. But that has happened once. Mm. <laughs> you know, if you name a couple of other times, that happened. You can maybe name a couple, but, you know. But you can't, you can't you know, dump on somebody's dream. Right. Oh, you, you're not allowed to have that dream. So what can I say? Go for mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And, uh, you know. See you when I see you when I can make the speech if the speech needs to be made. Hmm. Um. Now, uh, I think you know. Also, uh, these days, I would say like the 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 comedy world has also changed in the, in the fact that you can't say much anymore. You know. I mean, I, I looked oh, up some crazy. of your jokes, then uh, one specifically that ended with. Uh, what did it say? And the and the masochist says meow. And oh, I, well, I, I, <laughs> oh I, that that one is so ridiculous. Uh-huh. I can do it. It's it's a performance piece, uh-huh. and it, it it's a, it's about the words that we use. And so it's I mean, and it's it's a, it's a that that one can still be done. Uh, um, but it it was always bothersome. I mean, mm. to people, to some people. But I mean, there's just so much. Everybody is so fucking sensitive. You have no idea when you're stepping on toes. Right. I mean, you don't even realize that you're saying something until somebody comes back to you and says, well, that's your white privilege. You know, mm-hmm. Which I never thought I had because I'm gay and I'm Jewish. Mm-hmm. And the idea that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I had certain privilege in the sense that I, I came from a family that was that had some money. But... Um, 
But the idea that, you know, that, and I mean, it's as part of the critical race theory and that racism is baked in. And so, um, you know, I didn't know that was my white privilege because I was looking at it. I was looking at it from a different perspective and I guess right. that's called white privilege. And okay, so now I get that. But that makes, the, you know, that just creates the most amazing minefield because you wind up second guessing yourself. And that's always kind of antithetical to, uh, to humor. I mean, you know, uh, you have to maintain a sense of humor. And yeah. if you're always saying, well, I don't know. I mean, I just got notes on a script I wrote about political correct. This is from an Israeli. <laughs> an Israeli producer who uh, learned the term political correctness, and uh, uh, and it, but basically he's responding to things the way the you know the woke mob is responding to things. And he's, mm -hmm. Everything is being filtered through wokeness, and you know it just makes everything kind of crazy. Right. So I, would it be more difficult these days to write comedy? Because I feel I feel like it is. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think I just did 10 minutes on it, didn't I? <laughs> it's more difficult because everybody is so sensitive. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, it's also difficult to write uh, mysteries now that are mm. set in modern day because everybody's on their phones and they, everybody knows everything. So all the old, the old tropes we used in mysteries about, oh, well, he couldn't know that because he was here and it was happening there, that doesn't count anymore. Everybody knows everything now, instantly. So that's, I think, why there's a yearning for, for a period pieces. It's why so many popular things, Game of Thrones, things like that, are written in an era where they didn't have all of that, and you could use the old school mystery tropes, and you could throw in dragons. Yeah. In Game of Thrones. But I mean, I think a lot of, a, a lot of the reason why there's there's a, a, a so much stuff that's developed that didn't isn't contemporary. It's partially because people are afraid to offend people, and also because the the uh, the world has changed. Devices have changed everything. Right. Um, and now you you know you mentioned something uh, a couple minutes ago. You mentioned you know uh, looking at things through like through the gay lens, right? And I I wonder you know uh, in the seventies and the eighties, right? Was it difficult being a gay man in entertainment then and what what struggles did you face uh well it wasn't difficult for me because i made clear that i was gay and mm -hmm. and you know entertainment i mean i'm in the creative side of, the, of, of show business where flamboyance is encouraged and eccentricities are entertained and so uh it wasn't that difficult for me it, would be, it was difficult for the guy who was the lawyer representing the show to be gay, to be out, because uh, he was in a, a kind of straight-laced uh, profession, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so it was more. So he was more of a hero. The doctors, the lawyers, all of those people uh, who were who were out, they were they had a real struggle because there was a genuine homophobia. The homophobia that existed in show business was largely about actors because uh, they wanted to to the audience to believe that he could kiss the girl. That was always the first rule. Whenever they would cast a guy, they'd say, can he kiss the girl? And that's why it's the last, the last holdout, that in major league sports, the last holdout of, uh, of uh, the closet. Because, mm -hmm. because uh, they are, they are su such macho operations. All of that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and there was a certain prejudice against writers and uh, directors and, and people like that. And, uh, but it was no more than any, any place any place else, I think. And I, I have a feeling, I'm sure that I didn't get jobs because I was out. And I have a feeling that there were jobs I would not want to have had because I wouldn't want to work with those people. A couple mm -hmm. of times I was offered things in situations that I thought were kind of homophobic and I didn't feel like dealing with it. I wasn't, when I was, you know, I was not a professional homosexual. I was a homosexual professional. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't, I wasn't going to go in there and, and, you know, take a stand. I just wanted to work and, and be funny. Mm -hmm. and so, and that evolved, you know, I became kind of a, a combination of the two as the movement began to get more and more visible with AIDS. AIDS changed everything and it gave, right. gave people a, 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 an infrastructure with which they could move on to, to same-sex marriage equality, which uh, was ultimately the, the civil right that, every, that was needed to mm -hmm. cover all the other civil rights. Anyway, um, 
So I, I guess I, I have I evolved. <laughs> uh huh. Um, you you talked about AIDS. I I know you do a, a lot of charities. What are what are some charities that you're you're Im- involved with? Well, I was uh, I was on the board of the LA Gay and Lesbian Center for 22 years, and that's the biggest gay organization in the world. I mean, it uh, it services more people than any any other one, and uh, it's a huge operation. Uh, and I was on, I worked for all for APLA, all the AIDS charities that came along. Uh, at the beginning, you know, uh, at the beginning 40 years ago. Um, all, they were all small volunteer organizations because nobody wanted to touch the disease. They were all terrified. And uh, so I, would, I came in and we started fundraising by doing shows because that's what children's people do. And uh, I would go to other people and I would say, look, I'll do your disease if you'll do my disease. <laughs> so I wound up doing everything. Cerebral palsy, spina bifida, I know all about them. I have all the major diseases. I'm on speaking terms. <laughs> Uh, because they would they would come in and they would do uh, the shows we were doing, and uh, and so it, it just got it as it got with Rock Hudson it got more mainstream and so uh, and Elizabeth Taylor came in and she made it big time because uh, everybody would take her call I used to joke with her even the Pope will take a call from her if only to discuss jewelry <laughs> because the Pope has almost as much as Elizabeth had. Is that right? <laughs> oh, the Pope. Yeah, they. Yeah, they're they're a heavy Jewy crowd there in the Vatican. They collect. <laughs> that's. Uh, I mean, that's that. that that's uh, where where they keep all the money too. I guess. Uh, so like I collect- hear. <laughs> so I hear the Jews aren't allowed too close. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, oh God, I will tell you. I I, I was. About 20 years ago, I was on. I was doing a gay cruise. I was performing on a gay cruise, and we were in Rome, and we. We, we toured the Vatican, which I'd never seen. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I mean, I'd been to Rome. I'd never had occasion. I'd, I'd never cared that much. So, But I wanted to so be fun to be on a gay group going through the Vatican. <laughs> and uh, so the guide, our Vatican guide, was, was showing us things. And I said, this is probably the largest group of gay people you've ever had in the Vatican. He just kind of lowered his glasses at me and said, really? <laughs> As if to say, everybody who works here is gay. <laughs> Don't you get it? But oh man! Now, I, now I, I'm sure there'll be the, uh, you Catholics are rising against me somewhere and out in La Puente, <laughs> probably lighting a bonfire <laughs> as we speak. At yeah, some, got some at some heavy Catholic church. Uh, that's funny you mentioned La Puente. I do have a lot of uh, friends in La Puente. That's uh, that's that's good. That's well, good. One of the things I used to write was Chewy from La Puente who was a character on the Rick D's morning show on Kiss. Okay. Uh-huh. And Danny Lemos played him and wrote him. It was a character he came up with, Chewie from La Puente. Uh-huh. And they would check and he would do the traffic frequently. You know, uh-huh. he'd say, oh man, it's bad on the 605. You know, it was doing that kind of accent you can't do now. Right, and yeah. You know, you'd have to like, well, he was, me- he was Mexican-American, uh, but... Um, I think you have to come. You, are you. I don't even know if you could do it now. I mean, I, uh, I don't know if anybody a has a sense of humor about it, or if they, or if if you like, you come on and you really are Mexican, Mexican. Uh, but it's kind of like you know, gays doing a, a fag accent. You know, like I'll, mm, I'll marry. Mm-hmm. You know, or Jews doing an old "Oi, uh, vayas kind of accent. I mean, uh, a lot of a lot of. People in those communities res- uh, don't respond well to those either. So, well, I mean, they try to cancel. Uh, <laughs> they they try to cancel uh, Fluffy Gabriel Iglesias from being uh, oh, uh, the new the new uh, Speedy Gonzalez. Ah, they're, yeah. first they're rebooting Speedy Gonzalez. Well, in uh, the new Space Jam movie, I think oh, with oh, LeBron so James. Course. Yeah, right, Space Jam. So, uh-huh. did he get it or he did not get it? He actually got ahead of it and said, you know, hey, please don't cancel me. I want to be Speedy Gonzalez. Right, I'm not a, I'm not offended by this. And I like that, you know, because I'm I'm Hispanic. I was never, you know, offended by Speedy Gonzalez. I I uh-huh. I, I mean uh, maybe his his cousin Slowpoke Rodriguez who was <laughs> <laughs> who was like super like heavily drunk Mexican um a, a, a true, well that was like Chewy. Chewy had a cholo cousin, I forget. He had, and he had, uh, who had a wife who they called uh, La Tortuga. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of jokes about her. She was real uh-huh. fat. I mean, it was, you know, 
all of these sort of conventional stereotypes that were funny and were accepted. But this is as I, this is 40 years ago. Seriously, mm -hmm. I think about it now. This is in the 80s we were doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's changed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, I I personally think it's not for the better. Uh, I don't know your overall opinion if it's for the better or for the worse, or it's just an, or it's just change. Well, you know, if I say I th if I say I think it's for the worse that, that uh, we can't do that, then that's my white privilege kicking in, right? Because it's from my vantage point. But uh, so, but that's what I feel. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand if you know somebody who's you know sitting in La Puente listening to this saying, "Hmm, Conyo, that fag," you know, I got, I understand that. <laughs> So it's all, you know, we all, we come from wherever we come from and we evolve as best we can. But mm -hmm. I, I do miss that stuff because to me, all that stuff is benign. But not all of it, obviously, because I'm a member of minorities and I get it when people do fag jokes and I get it when people do Jew jokes. Uh, and I'm not happy about that. But I wouldn't say cancel them because mm -hmm. they're doing this stuff. I think everything has a context. And if you, if you put it in the right context, it's funny. It can still be funny. Mm -hmm. but some, sometimes I'm banging my head against the wall. You know, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you look at entertainment now, too, and, and something like, uh, I don't know if you ever watched like uh, any pro wrestling like WWE, but they did some really, really crazy stuff in, you know, the year 2000, 2005, whatever. Um, and so now that uh, Peacock NBC has purchased the rights to, to, the, to the WWE footage, they're like uh, cutting out. They're cutting out like you know hours of segments because you know you can't have somebody wearing blackface anymore. Oh um, uh, yeah, well it, this we you know, know. Yeah, and so it's things like that, you know. So I wonder if at some point we're just gonna you know uh, go go mad and 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 start you know canceling and erasing things. Um, even Disney Plus, you know, you there's a warning before Pinocchio, before Robin uh, was. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, Peter, what's the other one? Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Yeah. Um, about oh, Indians? Is that about the Tiger right. Lily and all that? Uh, well, you know, you know I, I, let them put a warning on it. I mean, I don't care. Let them have those conversations. Mm -hmm. It's important that the con if for people who were younger and and don't get the context that things were done in. They think it was it was made yesterday. And, mm. uh, and how can they be doing this? How can they have people going ugga wugga wigwag and all that stuff? Um, uh, so, I, so I get it. I mean, I don't mind any of that stuff. It's when they say, no, you can't show this anymore. You can't see it anymore and all that. Right. And I mean, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of wrestling. So it's, it's not since Gorgeous George died. So <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm old school. <laughs> <laughs> I used to look like Haystack Calhoun. He was a big wrestler. In, in, Ooh. Yeah, it was the overalls and everything. Yeah, overalls, and he would do the big, the big splash, which was he would just bounce on top of them. That was his big knockout thing. Uh -huh. but, I mean, I was a kid in the fifties, and that was you know that was we watched that on TV, and we went to see it at the Armory. It was fabulous. Gorgeous George was hilarious. Yeah, even now I, I remember I was watching some of his stuff on YouTube. I'm like. The match doesn't start till like ten minutes after he does his whole oh, routine. Oh, please! He has to perfume the ring first. Uh huh. Come around with a little squirter. <laughs> yeah. Great performance oh, before the show. Well, oh, very show business. But I, I never developed a fondness for wrestling. I mean, I grew out of that, but uh, it was a kid thing. But uh, so I had no idea they were doing that. I did a show and uh, which was recently accused of blackface, and I said. Uh, the character is an alien from another planet. It's not a mm -hmm. human. Mm -hmm. An alien can't be doing blackface. Mm -hmm. An alien is an alien. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, get real. The fuck right. is wrong with you people? <laughs> it's a makeup yeah. thing. I uh -huh. mean, it was, it was astonishing. I mean, it's just, but, but, you know, there's no cure for stupid, as we learned in the last election, two elections. I mean... <laughs> Uh, enough people will vote for stupid. There are enough mouth breathers out there who are who you know don't you can't you can't cure that you can't mm -hmm. cure mouth breathers. It's just right. Yeah, waving flags and storming the Capitol, baby. Nancy, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> Phrase that oh. will echo through the corridors of time. <laughs> 
Um, what do you, I mean, what do you, st- what do you have going on? I know you mentioned you were doing, you know, live shows is, before the pandemic. Is that something that you were doing a lot I was, of? I was doing live shows. I, I won't probably start up again until November, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I've been writing. I wrote a musical with Dolly Parton, which is we're gonna go, we're gonna workshop, and uh, I'm writing a, a, a thing now uh, uh, with the, I'm involved with Whoopi again, and uh, so I've been I've been busy. I've been I've been busy. Right, I have nothing to plug, but I've been busy working. And there were in between there were a million zooms, and you know uh, a lot of uh, writing projects, television. They've continued working through Zoom. So right. there was, there was, I was very lucky because I'm a writer and writers can work. People who uh, are in the performing arts couldn't work were in really bad sh- shape because they, mm-hmm. they, they, there was no revenue. There could be no audiences. But mm-hmm. even what they were doing was nothing compared to the first responders, people who were out there who had to actually deal with the, with the pandemic on a daily mm-hmm. basis. So I was really, very lucky and I just never crowed about it because uh, you know, I'm lucky, and, and uh, just just the way the way the, the hand was dealt. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, I I just kind of kept I just kept producing stuff, then getting okay. paid, which is a nice thing. But yeah, I, I, I I'm curious to see what's next with Whoopi Goldberg. I was actually just watching a uh, Sister Act right now. I remember, I love those old you know '90s uh, movies, and uh, you know it's just they're they're silly, they're funny, but they're they're still memorable. They're good, you know. There, there's some kind of uh, of reboot going on with Sister. I know that there's, you know, there's a musical which uh, she was supposed to do in London. They were going to revive it, and now they may revive it on this side, not with her. But uh, there's not. I think there's talk of a new Sister Act movie. Um, uh, you know, like there'll be there's a new Hocus Pocus for Disney Plus, Hocus Pocus two finally, and the girls will be in it, but it'll be about. It'll be an origin story like Cruella. It'll be uh, like we'll see the Sanderson sisters when they're young. So I think that the new sister act, uh, maybe Whoopi will be the mother superior this time. And mm. it'll, be, it'll be some other, I don't know, some other modification of it. Who knows? But I know they're, at Disney, they're cooked everywhere. But at Disney especially, they're reheating everything they ever did. Mm-hmm. Because uh, unfortunately, I discovered that it's easier... To, to do that and to create something original. And uh, I do see a lot of like, uh, like nineties reboots going on now, you, you know, everything, everything old becomes new again. You know, you had the time where all the seventies stuff started coming up again, all the eighties stuff started coming up again. I think the nineties are up, you know, they're up next. Uh, you mentioned Disney and Disney's doing right. um, like the mighty ducks. They have the new mighty duck show up and, and, yeah. and, and, and it does uh, have a throwback to the, to, to the old uh, the movies. Because Emilio Estevez is in there. He even got some of the original kids to appear on an episode. So, it, I mean, I like that. I'm a 90s kid. You know, well, that, all- I mean, part of the reason people do that is because now it's multi generational. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kids are discovering it for the first time, but their parents saw it when they were kids. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, <laughs> maybe their grandparents saw it when they were kids, depending on what it is. But uh, so that's. <laughs> You know, brand recognition, and that's a big thing among corporate people. And unfortunately, it, it's uh, uh, it makes it harder for the originals to come through. And the joke is, when something original does come through, it come it bursts through. I mean, like Hamilton is the biggest thing in theater; and it's totally original, mm-hmm. uh, and there's been nothing like it before. And that's one reason why it's a, a juggernaut. But you would think with that, and Book of Mormon was another one, and you would think that with, uh, with, with that possibility in view, uh, they would d- develop more original stuff. But no. But no. <laughs> but no. <laughs> No, no. Let's let's you know, let's bring back Joni loves Chachi, but lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, you know, uh, just a few th- a few things left, uh, Bruce. And I really again appreciate your time. Um, what uh, you know? What's a few things? If, if if you had to reintroduce, you know, the the '90s kids, the 2000s kids to Bruce Valanche, what are some some things that you know you want to highlight about? your entire uh, career in entertainment. Wow. 
Well, I mean, the you know, the big things are uh, Hollywood Squares, and I wrote all those Oscar shows, and I did Hairspray on Broadway and on the road for two years, and uh, uh, and then uh, I, I started out with Bette Midler. She was the first person I wrote for, and I'm still working with her, and so I've been with her all along the way. And so those are kind of like, you know, and won a bunch of Emmy Awards while I was at it uh, and lost a bunch of, of Emmy Awards also. But uh, I guess that would kind of like be it. And, and uh, you know, the, I guess the, the fact that uh, a gay icon, I hear that a lot because oh. uh, I used to write for The Advocate, which was the, like the gay New York Times. And so off of that, I got a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of traction. So. I guess those are the things. I mean, you know, it's, I, I, it's always curious to see. Bet and I have a running gag. We always say that when she dies, the, the obituary will say, or the headline will be, Bet Midler dies, singer started in gay bathhouse. <laughs> because she did, basically. And, uh, and, and she could never let go of that. I mean, she owns it, you know. Is, is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, her first, her first, she was on Broadway in Fiddler on the Roof, but nobody knew her. And mm. her first gig as herself was at a, a Turkish bath, was at the gay Turkish bath in the other continental baths. Yeah. Mm. And her piano player was Barry Manilow. Wow. Oh, I didn't know that. It go, yeah. And, and, uh, and I got involved and in the first backup singer we hired was Luther Vandross. Oof. Yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so on. And Melissa Manchester and Katie Segal was a backup singer and Jennifer Lewis was a backup singer. The heart of history. Yeah. There's a lot of it, but that's I'm I'm in the book now, uh, <laughs> so a, a lot of that history was yeah exactly. I mean she was a linchpin for a lot of people, but it started in a Turkish bath. Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, you know next little thing here, um, Hollywood Squares. I, I started off. Uh, I think what uh, for for you anyway it was it was it was like a reboot of of an old game show, right? It was the third version of it. I mean, the first version was on NBC for 14 years. Uh -huh. And that was the one that had Paul Lind. And then um, it came back in the 80s with John Davidson and Joan Rivers and uh -huh. Wayland and Madam. And, and then we came back in the 90s with, with right. Tom Peron and Whoopi. So my and question there. VH1 on it as hip hop squares. If you know, if you can believe it. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. If, if it's it was been good. on for 10 years. It's been on MTV2 or VH1. I forget which one. But it's the same show with rappers because rappers are so funny. <laughs> well, that cancels out my question. I was going to ask, do you think there'll be a Hollywood squares? Uh, well, reboot? if that one ever dies, the, uh, maybe. I mean, you know, the difference between the, the reboots of, of the other shows, like To Tell the Truth and and... Um, match game was that they 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 didn't work the last times they were rebooted, and mm -hmm. Hollywood Squares has always worked. So mm -hmm. it would it would have to uh, uh, it would have to have there would have to be a, a, another decent interval, and and okay. maybe I don't know. Yeah, part of the reason that all those things are rebooted is because they are cheaper to produce mm -hmm. than uh, than scripted television shows. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why. And uh, um, if they're real, I mean, they're if they're the gold mines like Family Feud or Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune, they've been on for a hundred years. Yeah. They work. The celebrity ones are harder to keep going because not, you, not that you run out of celebrities, but you run out of interest in them mm -hmm. at a certain point. And also because celebrities are everywhere now. Yep. You know, I mean, you just, there, there, are, there are five, six shows a night that are just about who J-Lo is humping this week. <laughs> And I mean, is, I would is assume. It man, is, it, is it this? Is it, is it Diddy? Is it Daddy? Is it who is it? <laughs> I mean, and there are five shows a night with pictures of J Lo coming out of the gym. So. Uh huh. And then also, you know, the 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 uh, definition of celebrity has changed. You know. Well, now that you know, you can be a Kardashian and be the biggest star in the world. Right. And, and basically, all you do is is be on a show about yourself. Uh -huh. I mean, it's kind of amazing, but I get, I get what their success is like because I get that there is, is uh, an audience of of girls who've never seen girls like that on TV be rich and famous. Mm. They are not the white privileged types that we always see. They mm. are very much, uh, you know, they're they're multi breed. They're they're Armenian and they're they marry basketball players and everybody is it's all one great big melting pot. And that's something different to see. 
Mm. And and the audience they're going for are the young, the tweens, the young girls who will buy the makeup and buy the dresses. And that's where the real money is made. Because mm-hmm. they see Kendall Jenner dre- dressed up that way and they want to dress up that way. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's a lifestyle thing. And, and, so, and the corollary is they become big stars. They are mm-hmm. big stars and then people who actually record or make movies are doing any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what's uh, really quickly, uh, you know, one bit of advice that you could give somebody trying to break into entertainment right now? Well, if you have a large penis, you're in luck. <laughs> Somebody will always be interested in you. Uh-huh. A big, big dick, big tits always work. I mean, there's just, you know, since we are on the shit show, we can be honest yeah. and say that. Yeah. Uh, that will give you a leg up. Legs are not bad either. Uh, and the thing they're attached to, the ass, that's pretty, pretty uh, efficient. But other than that, you have to have, it's helpful if you have talent. Mm-hmm. And but uh, what is even more is ambition and and uh, ambition, but not like a kind of crazy stuff that makes you kill people to get what you want. And mm-hmm. ambition translated into a really strong work ethic, discipline, getting training, knowing your craft, and uh, and uh, continuing to practice it. And it's. And to do it and to, to try and juggle that with making a living, which is, which is not easy. Mm-hmm. But uh, ultimately, uh, the, the old line is, uh, is there's no such thing as luck. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, it, and it, you have a big dick. Yeah. You know? It's the truth. And what? <laughs> and, and if you have a big dick. And if you have a big dick. Yeah. <laughs> that will get you in the door. In fact, it will help you keep the door open. All right. So for all of the for all of the the uh, the unhung heroes or the <laughs> <laughs> the unhung heroes, very good. Yeah. There we go. That's and why I never liked wrestling. They're all <laughs> on steroids, and the junk is all Minnie Mouse. Oh man! Well, 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 I mean, The Rock's the biggest deal in Hollywood right now. Well, so. yeah, but, but that he's lad, he's latter day. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, lastly, you know, um, obviously, you're still you, you're still funny. There's still a lot of gas in the tank. You know, what are some uh, big goals that you have left uh, to accomplish well, in your career? It's, uh, well, you know, I would like to publish the book. I'd like people to read it. I would like to be, I'd like to do a TV series. That would be fun. Oh. Uh, uh, and I've tried a few times and nothing's happened. So I don't really, I don't, if I had a goal, I would actually be better off because I'd be pushing towards it. Mm. But I don't. I, I mean, I've always, my, my, my motto was always to have a good time doing what I'm doing. And if I, if I wasn't, I would stop doing it. Mm-hmm. And I've had a very varied career as a result. And so I never wanted one day to be like the next day. I wanted everything to have some kind of flavor to it. And, okay. and that was what I strove for. Uh, had I, you know, had I striven <laughs> to, to do something else, I, I, I would have been a different person. Mm-hmm. Well, again, I, I, I really appreciate you having you on, you know, thank you for your time. Um, I, I, man, I want to, I want to see some of those new projects, especially that Whoopi Goldberg one. So, um, you know, good luck with everything. You're here. <laughs> yeah, good, You're definitely here. good. Good luck with everything. I'll be keeping you should know that in my hometown, Patterson, New Jersey, all the movies played the Fabian Theater. Oh, really? The Fabians, who were, were a big Jewish family in Jersey, and they were in the movie exhibition business. And they they okay. had a deal with Metro with MGM and all the big movies came to the theater which was named after them the Jacob Fabian uh, and the Fabian the- and it's still in Patterson New Jersey this mm-hmm. old theater is torn down and they built a multiplex called the Fabian Eight which now shows a mix of, uh, 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 Patterson's very Muslim now so a lot of of uh, of, uh, of pictures in Arabic and Farsi and you know and uh, and a lot of a lot of Spanish language, a lot of I mean, it's like an international movie theater. Huh. And you know, on one screen there'll be Spider Man thirty two, and then there'll be these other little strange little movies from across the seas. To because the, it's such an ethnic audience now, and it's the Fabian. You should Google it. You get a kick out of it. You can I maybe you can maybe heist their logo and use it somewhere. <laughs> For sure. Any uh, any anything you want to put out there as far as websites or where people can find you or anything like that? Uh, we got Bruce.com. Okay. 
we got Bruce. That, uh, 20 years ago, Harvey Weinstein made a movie about me called Get Bruce, and he never laid a hand on me. <laughs> Hashtag why not me? <laughs> but it's, it's a funny movie, and it, it's called Get Bruce. We're doing the sequel, Had Bruce, with a much larger cast. But We Got Bruce is a website that uh, a, a fan of mine runs, and he knows what I'm doing. Uh, before I know I'm doing it, I'm stunned sometimes. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So that yeah. wraps it up. For everybody yeah. listening at home, I appreciate you. Thank you. Fuck you, and good night. Ooh. Good night. on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Like, follow, and share on Facebook and Instagram at Ignorance of Strength Podcast and on Twitter at The Ignorance Pod.